Bruce intends Game of Death to be a philosophical film mirroring his own personal quest for perfection. He works obsessively on his fourth physically demanding film in 13 months. He is losing weight and never seems to rest. Publicly, he preaches fluidity and relaxation, but in private, he is becoming increasingly agitated, impatient, and inflexible. As soon as he had finished making the first film, which was The Big Boss, um, he sent it to me. Uh, I, were, when I had seen the film, scheduled a screening over at the chairman of Warner Brothers, Ted Ashley, uh, and we went to his house and saw the film, and he flipped over it also. I said, why don't we write a script now for this artist? He's doing fantastic. The money will be gotten back out of the uh, Far East and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And uh, so it was decided to go ahead and try to do something with it. Uh, a script was written, and uh, eventually I went over to Hong Kong. And uh, a deal was made between Golden Harvest, Raymond Chow, his company, and um, Warner Brothers. And that was the picture called Into the Dragon. It was uh, stressful at stages because I think Bruce was uh, very nervous about doing this big film. It was his first international film with a big budget. And so that was a little stressful watching the stress Bruce put himself under. And, and, uh, but it was interesting watching how Fred handled Bruce and how Paul Heller handled him. Bruce was so nervous he didn't want to he, he didn't want to start he was just afraid that it wasn't going to work well and uh he for him it was he had a great deal at stake i mean this was his first starring role in an international film all english film whatever and it was his the weight of it rested on his shoulders and he was he's, bruce was very bright i mean he he understood all that it implied he first when we started the film he didn't show up for a while and uh, for the first week or two, it was hard finding. I was shooting everything but Bruce Lee in this film and reporting back to Warner Brothers. Everything's going fine, but I couldn't send them any film yet on Bruce Lee. He had sort of gotten cold feet. The first scene that he did in the studio, he was so nervous and so physically shaking. We shot the scene where he's sitting down in a chair and they had just sort of turned his head. It's the only action we gave him in that first scene and managed to get through it. It was a little bit shaky. We really worked hard with Bruce, but Bruce knew what he wanted in the fights. But as time went on, um, he, he became more and more difficult. And I think it was because he had this enormous energy. Bruce was never tired on the set. I saw him work uh, tirelessly. And uh, it was, uh, he knew exactly what he wanted when it came to the fights. He worked at his trade and such all the time. Uh, he, seemed, he seemed not to sleep. And uh, he would call at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I've got an idea for a change in the script. Meet me at so-and-so restaurant. So I wasn't getting any sleep, and, uh, but he didn't seem to need it. Believe me, all five of Bruce's films were Bruce Lee films. He really put his stamp on them, he controlled it. And he absolutely made sure that all, of, all the fight scenes, all the action scenes were done the way he wanted them, period, I'm in. He uh, also worked out fight scenes, um, drawing little stick figures, which he was very good at. And uh, he would uh, choreograph the entire fight on paper, these little stick figures. And uh, very easy to follow. And uh, he was extremely inventive in and uh, fight sequences and, and the approach to fighting drum. And, uh, and meticulous and he, uh, and he wanted to be extremely accurate. To create an illusion within an illusion, 8,000 mirrors are brought in to form a set. The cinematographer plans to film the violent but ballet-like action of Bruce Lee in slow motion to give the scene a new dimension. It is very difficult for the director to confine the movement between the actor and the mirrors to hide all possible reflections of camera and lights. It will take hours of coordination and planning before Robert Klaus and Bruce Lee are set to begin.
there were unbelievable differences between making a film in Hollywood and making a film in Hong Kong. I mean, um, they would rent the set, and every night they would set, send the set, the set back. In other words, they rented a couch, and then the next day they would come back and, and they would have a different couch, a different color. And I said, where's the couch we had yesterday? We had to finish the scene. And they said, oh, they sold it. I mean, that was the kind of problems that occurred. There was, a, for instance, a wonderful scene at the end of the movie where we have all the martial artists in white fighting against the martial artists in the black outfits. And what had happened, it took a couple of days to shoot that big scene. And of course, I got there early in the morning and um, all the white outfits were gone. And I said, where are all the white outfits? And the, the costume were from Hong Kong. said, oh, they were very dirty. We sent them to the cleaners. And I said, well, we need them. He said, well, they were at the clean. We got into trucks. We ran down. The, we had all these wet white suits that we had to put on all the extras. And of course, that was just one of a thousand little things that occurred. We, we were going to shoot a boat scene. And we got to the boat. And we said to the man, today was the day we, we arranged for the boat. He said, you can't have the boat today. And I said, but today's the day we arranged. And he said, no, you can't have the boat. And I figured, well, maybe it's because I have to give him a little bit more money or something. Had nothing to do with that. He was just a very superstitious. He said, if you want this picture to be successful, do not take the boat out today. And there was no way I could talk to him or talk him in. We shot around it and shot, came back a day later shot that scene and shot the times, boat. Eight times to be exact, but, uh, the particular just... scene with the broken bottles. Each time we'd shoot the scene, I'd have to break the real bottles. Uh, and Bruce instructed me to take the jagged edge of my right hand, which I had one in each hand, but lunge with the right hand at his right pec. And Bruce's words were, come at me as fast as you can. So on the sixth time that we shot it, Bruce had his right hand up and he'd started to spin. And as he spinned, he jammed his fist into the glass. And so Freddie Weintraub called me and said, you know, uh, there's a rumor that Bruce is going to kill you. And uh, I went back after his hand was well and we shot the rest of the scene where he sidekicks me. And he sidekicked me so hard. I mean, Bruce hit like a mule. Um, that in, in one of the scenes when he, he hit me, uh, I flew back and one of the stuntmen behind me, his arms got broken from the impact. Um, I hit him so hard he fell into Bob a chair. Bob was as ready so for Bruce it as anybody could be, but Bruce, when the time came, and we had about three cameras all going high speed, Bob went flying. He went, he must have gone 30 feet. <laughs> through the chairs, through everything. And he was, he was going to try to stonewall it. I mean, he was going to really just be there and stop Bruce dead. So Bruce hit me it. hard. Well, in that scene, I'm pretending I'm groggy, and all Bruce had to do was come up and kick me in the face or in the neck, and I'd have been in serious trouble. Well, clearly he didn't do that. And uh, so there really was no problem between Bruce and I. Um, it was just, I mean, I felt terrible then, and I feel terrible 20 years later that, that he got hurt. But it wasn't a... a, a a threatening, a life-threatening injury by any means. It was just an unfortunate accident.